A stranger with a gun came upon two teens taking pictures under a rising full moon. But violence is only the beginning of this story. Sometimes I thought, there are no miracles. Yeah, there are, and this is a big one. I'm Amy Donaldson, and I've spent my career talking about how lives are undone by violence. The Letter is a podcast about how lives are remade. Follow The Letter at theletterpodcast.com or wherever you get your podcasts. Back again here on Project Recovery, we've got Keaton here. He's been sharing his story. Uh, The first couple episodes talked about Rehab 1 and Rehab 2. Now this is where uh, Casey comes into the picture. So I met Keaton in detox, and uh, you came in a day after me. Do you remember that? It's it's pretty pretty hazy. <laughs> De- detox, there's not a lot of so explain from. explain. Is that the same as rehab, Casey, or is that different? Detox and see, this was my first experience into detox. Uh, Keaton will tell you he's had a few, a, f- a few. <laughs> and so detox is where you go in and for seven days. They walk you off of your DOC, your drug of choice. Uh, so you've just come off some usually pretty stressful life event where your drug of choice was involved and you just can't handle being on your own. They put you in a hospital-type setting. Is yep, that right? And, okay. and, and you have meetings in there, and that's where I was introduced to Pinnacle Rehab. But uh, tell me your experience with uh, detox. Yeah, so uh, we detoxed up at, at uni at the University of Utah. Um I've been there six or seven times. Um, but, yeah, my understanding is it's to safely withdraw from substances that you're dependent on. Um, so the one of the, like, crazy sad things about detox for me is that, like, going into detox that last time is, like, I finally felt, like, hope for the first time in a while. Like, like being being basically homeless and like couch surfing and being like extremely messed up and like my body was physically failing. Like I had a lot of internal issues from the amount of alcohol that I was consuming. Um, like when I walked through those doors, I was like, thank you. And that's, I think that's a really sad place to be, but also like that's the start. That's where you, that's where you go to start, start the process in my, do you think you said thank you because maybe for the first time since you started this whole ordeal, you were ready for it to be ending? I wanted it to be over so badly. Um, and, like, before that detox, like, earlier in that summer, because we, we went in, what, September of mm-hmm. 2018? Earlier that summer, like, I was really dealing with a lot of uh, suicide stuff. I went, I was actually in uni for um, some suicide stuff. Um, and and then I, decide, I, like, had decided that I didn't want to commit suicide, but then all of a sudden my body was, like, literally failing me because of – the abuse I'd put it through and yeah, I, I was like, I'm finally ready to be done with this. And I like felt a great sense of relief walking through those doors of uni. Like, I'll how be much, okay. how much do you think your substance abuse affected your suicidal thinking? I mean, how much are those related? I think they're super related. Um, as like, cause each time I've like blown my life up, it's gotten worse and worse in terms of like, like financial stuff in terms of the people I have left in my life in terms of like my options going forward where like I was like I just I just by that point I was like I can't I can't do this anymore like I don't want to live um feeling hopeless that things just so hopeless like I can't I can't I can't stay sober um I can't I can't do anything with my life and like what's the point of this I'm just miserable all the time and substance abuse definitely is was the cause of that for me. Like, I don't think if I was never using substances that I would have gotten to that point. So I met uh, Keaton in uni and we became fast friends. I mean, when you're in that situation, you find people that you're, uh, you know, like-minded or similar in personalities. And we started hanging out and uh, I came back to him after my meeting with Pinnacle Recovery first. And I said, I think I'm going to Pinnacle Recovery. And I said, this lady says, told me about this place. It sounds really cool. And I go, Keaton, you should come. Yeah. And uh, I I go to Pinnacle Recovery, and I'm there for one day. And then the next day, the door opens, and here walks this redheaded kid. I go, (laughs) Keaton, how are you? And he goes, yeah, I'm here. And so we we kind of went through it. I was just there one day before you. And uh, what did you like about Pinnacle Recovery? What did I like about Pinnacle Recovery? Um, Quite a bit. Uh, 
the I guess like right off the bat, just like the f- physical comforts of the surroundings were like excellent. Like I felt like I was going to be comfortable um, in terms of like comfy beds and like good food and stuff. And I, I mean, how that makes a difference for me. <laughs> but how, how, how does you think it makes a difference for a lot of people when they're going? Yeah, like I, I don't know. I, I, I think I've seen a lot of people in my in my 10 years of being like in and out of institutions and um, a lot of people that are very, very afraid of what's next. And so I think a comfortable, a comfortable environment is pretty darn important because there's a high level of fear. All right. Now let's talk, on. let's talk about your first recovery you said was 12 step based. Yeah. And your second recovery was what? Um, I, there was some 12 st- step stuff involved, but, uh, there were some, I guess, some other modalities involved as well, like some more like for those who don't CBT know, CBT therapy. A modality is what? A mo- Dr. Matt. <laughs> oh, it's just it's um, it's a method of of treatment. So we have a variety of different methods or ways of doing treatment, and so the twelve step recovery that AA promotes and, and various 12-step programs are an example of that. Then he said CBT, which is cognitive behavioral therapy. It's retraining our patterns of thinking and behavior, in this case, probably around substance abuse and probably issues of depression and hopelessness as well that it caused by that. Now, so, I don't want to speak for you, Keaton, but for me, the thing that I really appreciated about Pinnacle Recovery was they threw a bunch of modalities at us. They let totally. us experience many different ones and what i liked about it is what it was kind of like an a la carte okay what works for you okay they let you sample these various ways of of treatment types of treatment and so you go okay i like that one that one rings true with me this one seems to. what's one that you like i I, I, I like the meditation uh i like the honesty and um I like the working out. Had you ever meditated before? Was that something? No. No, I, no, I never meditated. And like I said, I was there for 45 days, and meditation didn't click until probably day 21. Okay. Almost three Halfway. weeks into mm-hmm. it. Uh, and there were some people that as soon as they, you know, I remember one guy, for example, we were doing meditation, and afterwards he goes, this is stupid. <laughs> I didn't pay for you to have me meditate. I want you to fix me. You know, and yeah, then like, that's the, you that, know, sure. It, it was like, hey, look, I, I can do this at home. I'm paying right. you good money, you know, and, and they go, just you got to. And that's that traditional, like, medical model of treatment, which is doctor provides the cure to the patient. Mm-hmm. And that's what he wanted. And that's often what we all have in mind when we go in for any sort of health care. But this is different, isn't it? How is it different for you? Like, could could that have worked for you if somebody just came and handed you a treatment? I thought that was how it worked, like, my first few times. Um, Probably the first couple times you yeah. had a similar attitude, huh? Yeah. Uh, but, like, the main thing that I've learned this time around is, like, it's about what I put into it. It's about what I, like, I, it's, a, it's a level of, like, acceptance and effort, I guess. Um, and so what are some of the modalities or types of treatment that you clicked with when you were there. Casey's over there doing the hippie meditation stuff. Totally. What did you like? I I really enjoy that too. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, I like one of the most helpful things for me is like um, DBT, dialectic behavioral therapy. Um, Nailed it. Good job. Thank you. Should, I've heard it enough. I shouldn't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, what, what what is that? So, Doctor Matt, my understanding is no, it's like it's like the uh, that like two conflicting. Thoughts basically can exist at the same time. Mm-hmm. And in terms of for me and my substance abuse, it's like I really love I really love drugs and alcohol and I'm sober like that. Those two things can be true um, because and and that's like really helpful for me on my my level of acceptance is like I don't I don't have to pretend that that like I I hate drugs. I hate alcohol because. At the end of the day, I don't. So it's allowing you to recognize, number one, you have these competing beliefs, and, and number two, that they can, they can both exist, and that trying to deny that existence creates a certain amount of tension and conflict within yourself, right? Totally, totally. Yeah. Like, yeah, and, and that, like, the, one of the biggest differences for me in this go-around is my level of acceptance of, like, I'm sober and I don't do drugs, Um 
but like still recognizing that that like substances are are appealing to me but i don't have to use them mm-hmm. um and 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 i find a lot of relief from that in terms of like you know hanging out with my friends and like you know making jokes about drugs or whatnot being like man if if we if we ate some acid right now this would be like super fun and, and you just kind of laugh it off and it's like that's the end of it um so i, I find it extremely helpful in my so like, more uh, do you feel like you have more self-acceptance and a w- like understanding of how you operate yeah totally um because at, th- at this point like i know that drugs and alcohol don't work for me they're not a solution for for my problems of my problems of fear my problems of of self-esteem um and and i guess like previously i've tried to like deny that um deny that like i liked i like substances which is i do like them i know they're not a solution and I don't know. It's, it, it helps me like put it in a context. Well, that... in a way, I mean, you correct me if I'm wrong, but yeah. in listening to what you've said, especially going through the first two rehab experiences, it almost sounded like you felt like you you could keep doing it, like you could make it work for yourself. Yeah, that this rehab was just going to dry you up a little bit, so to speak, but that you could handle drinking and, and using drugs in your life, and it was gonna you were going to be able to do everything. And it sounds like that attitude changed somehow yeah. in this. What do you think changed that attitude? I I think I, I think like an honest reflection of like look at my past experiences of trying to fit drugs and alcohol into my life in either a like moderate capability or um, like a sometimes recreational thing. Like I I can't do that. I I have tried a million times and it's very clear to me that I am incapable of like drinking like a gentleman or like only using some of the cocaine when it's there like um did you feel like if there was a substance there you had to clean your plate so to speak you 100% had to finish it up 100% yeah Let me ask you this. You're six months sober. Congratulations on that. Where are you now right now? In terms of life or sobriety or everything? Let's do everything. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, f- I feel extremely positive because I feel like I'm living life on life's terms. Um, the – Wait, because that's heavy. Because I found myself saying that lately, is that not so eloquently as you put it, living life on life's terms. But I'm like, if I say I'm going to do something and I do it, there's very rarely any blowback. You know what I mean? Because yeah. you you know you're just doing what you said and what you're supposed you follow to follow through, and yeah. it's not that hard. But when you're in your attic head and your attic brain, you're always trying to figure out ways to work the system or get what you want, and then you forget where you started or where you finished, or and, and you're just playing catch up. And it just that's when it becomes chaotic. That's when it becomes hectic. And so yeah. you know, living life on its life's terms. I mean, I, I love that because it really simplifies everything. And totally. what we didn't, what I didn't realize is that I thought life was complicated. Now life has is complicated by itself in its nature, but when you but throw, you were making it more complicated, right? By always trying to work an angle and get away with something, and yes, be above the law or outside the law. Right? That's like why that. I wanted to do this podcast. Was if I get it out there in the open, mm-hmm. there's no angle to be work. I'm just letting you see as I go through this authenticity. And that was said a lot during our yeah. during our uh, your authentic self. Yeah, yeah you got to be your authentic yeah. self. And that's a real that's a real term. If, uh, listeners, I would challenge them to Google that, look it up, and read a little bit about what that concept means because it applies to people who are in recovery, but it applies to all of us. Are we being our authentic self? And when we do, life gets a lot more simple and a lot more in focus, manageable. Yeah, and so. So you're living life on life's terms, and where are you living right now? I'm in a sober living. I've been there since I got out of out of residential treatment. Tell I'll tell people just really months. quick what's the five cent version of what's a sober living? A sober living is um, a 
place to live that uh, does have some additional accountability to help you stay sober. Like so, what? Uh, like drug tests, um, like check-ins with checking in with people, um, just kind of not letting you just totally. So fly some by accountability. The in terms of face to face talking with people, doing some drug testing, yep. what happens if you violate that in a in a sober living? Typically, um, kind of depends on the place. Usually, you you might get one chance or something. But you, mm-hmm. people that start using drugs and alcohol in sober living are pretty quickly removed. And so, but once again, to, to pull a little Doctor Matt on you, it's a structure, and you like the structure, and the sober living gives you a kind of a structure to mm-hmm. live within. Yeah, and I mean it's still like it's it's not like it's a full fully structured day. It's like check in at the end of the day and like breathalyze and make sure you're not drunk and pee a couple times a week. But it's a little bit of a step down. So you went from an extremely structured like your detox was in a locked facility, yeah. right? They and take your shoelaces, they uh-huh. take your belt and they give you no slip socks. No, hell yeah. 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 When, when, I got, when I got into rehab, I mean, that was one of those things. It's like, what kind of no slip socks do you have? <laughs> you know what I mean? All right. It was like a swatch watch. Yeah. Oh, you know? very cool. Yeah. yeah, fashion, right? It's And everywhere. so, yeah, so you're right. So that one's very structured yeah. and monitored. And then, and then Pinnacle, uh, a typical recovery, how structured is – I mean, it sounds like it was pretty structured too. Uh, we, I mean, we had people around us all the time. We traveled in two big vans. Uh, you know, there was always somebody in the room with you, uh, mm-hmm. you know, that would watch and take notes. And I didn't realize this. Did you know they checked on us every hour while we were sleeping? I didn't know that. I didn't know that, you know, because I, one morning they was like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, huh. Did you that know? creep you out? No. Or did it make you feel secure? I, I, no, I was just kind of like. Huh. I didn't. Th- I didn't. I. I didn't have just anything. a head scratcher. Huh? Yeah, I was like, oh, okay, cool. And then now you're in. You're in sober living. So there's a little bit of structure as far as like you know they're gonna pop in on you and, and check on you and do the sort of stuff we've mentioned. How are you structuring your life right now? Do you feel like you've got a little more of a handle on that for yourself? Back to that concept of intrinsic or internal natural motivation. Yeah, um, I'm I'm trying to find some balance in my life for like the first time ever. Um, like when, when you're in sober living, it's it's not just like you sit around and be sober. The idea is that you re-enter society, um, get a job, and go to school or whatever you're gonna do. Um, like so, I'm I just started. And they're not going doing to that for you. They'll help you if you ask for okay. it. Okay, all right. So if um, so, they'll they'll provide a little assistance. But yep. it sounds like this is sort of this step down to more independence. Yep, yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, you like I said, you have your whole day to yourself. So like uh, right now, I I'm going to school, um, like four days a week. Um, I'm going skiing probably a little too much still, um, and you know going to a lot of meetings. You're skiing and, sober. Yep. So what does that do for you? How did I think? I I doubt you said a little too much. I don't know. We can talk about that, but I, I bet it does something positive for you. What does the skiing do for you? Totally. And and I've kind of gotten back to like the root of like why I enjoy skiing, um, which is it's it's a place where I can feel extremely present, um, and like number one, like the the physical exhilaration of skiing is terrific i love being outside in in nature and um and and being in a spot where i can be totally present and and clear my mind is is extremely valuable to me and i but i've i've used skiing like a drug in some ways over the years like where i've just you know tune everything out and go skiing so i i'm you the way i i like the skiing is in my life right now is it's like a healthy positive activity that um i'm doing like a few times a week instead of all day every day. Um, so it's I'm, a healthy activity. It's not just an escape from reality. Right, right. Let me ask you this: it's like, it's like a it's a it's a benefit I get to have as opposed to a escape. When when I was drinking a lot, I merged drinking and golfing and made them one. And yep. it used to infuriate my dad. He goes, "I don't understand. This is something that you love, and you clearly have a passion for golfing. And then you just ruin it by getting too drunk. I don't get that." And so when I got out of rehab, one of the scariest moments for me, and this just sounds stupid, but was going golfing without beer. 
Totally. Was it going to be weird? I Was I going to be okay? Uh, you know what I mean? And it was one of those milestones that I had to make myself do and have a good time with it. And, and, and wonder if I still loved golfing or if I loved the drinking that went with golfing. Did you experience that at all with skiing? Um, not really. No. I was honestly just excited to get back out there um, because, like, to, uh, also skiing to me is, like, a representation of my personal freedom and, like, having spent quite a lot of time in institutions and, like, scheduled over the past few years, like, I was just glad to be able to get out. Mm-hmm. But I but I do, like, like for me, it's golfing, it's disc golfing for me, and, like, it's still weird for me to go out there and, like, I pick up my bag and I'm like, this feels light. Like, there should be, like, ten beers in here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so let me ask you this. Uh, you're, you're in sober living. Uh, are you doing anything else for your sobriety right now? Yep. Yep. I go to, I go to quite a few AA meetings. Um, I wouldn't say I'm really working a 12-step program. Like I don't have a sponsor. Um, the benefit that I get from, from going to AA is, is two, I guess, twofold. Um, I do I do I do get a lot of inspiration from being around other sober people. I also get a lot of inspiration from being around newly like brand new sober people. Um like I'll go up to the some of the meetings at uni where there's the people that are still in detox there and it's like wow, these people are a mess and I was that mess many 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 times. It's it's a good reminder for me and just the social the social aspect of of um of AA is pretty cool. Um, you like the community, yeah. There's a lot of rad people there doing a lot of rad things. Um, you know, and as for me, I, I've said this before. Uh, you know, I'm not a, a 12 stepper, but the thing that I loved and was a real turning point for me in my recovery was when I sat in a room of 200 people. And I realized I wasn't alone in with what I was dealing That's with. That's powerful. It's very you, powerful. You know, to and share I went, that. okay, yeah. you know, because a lot of time in my addiction, I thought, why am I the broken one? Right. You know, I, you know, how come my friends can do this and drink like a gentleman and do this, but I'm the broken one? What's wrong with me? And I think people see that in those large groups in in, in like a an AA meeting setting. You see that there, are, you all sh- you may be different in a lot of ways, but you're all the same in a lot of ways, and you share that. You feel a sense of community and support. I think that's what you're saying um, is your experience. Why you might go back up to uni? Totally, yeah. And and like I've I've heard it quite a few times that the that connection is the opposite of addiction, and I like really really strongly believe that. And um, and by far like the number one most helpful thing for me on a daily basis in sobriety is human connection, and that. And that's not just like in my sober community. That's that's like having a good relationship with my family. That's having a good relationship with my friends that aren't sober but don't have problems. Um, that's having that's having s- strictly sober people to talk about stuff that I can't talk to with any other people about. So like being being connected on a lot of different fronts is really. I'll important throw to me. A, a question that comes to my mind though is earlier you mentioned that at least with. Your female relationships, you felt like you were codependent. Yep. How are you doing with, I mean, I think what you're describing sounds great and I really very healthy, but does codependency ever become, raise its head again? Um, it, it hasn't. Um, I guess, well, number one, like I'm not in an intimate relationship right now, so I guess I'm kind of avoiding that a little bit. Um, but codependency in terms of... Um, I don't know. I, I I feel I feel like the way I'm able to connect with people right now is I am able to th- through being open and honest. Um, I try to be open and honest in, in all of my relationships, regardless of how insignificant they are. Um, that and you're taking care of yourself. Yeah, and that's different. Like being honest in your relationships, and also in a healthy way, knowing what you need and taking care of what you need. That's kind of the opposite of codependency, isn't it? Yeah, I guess so you're you, right. Yeah, totally. You can benefit from real healthy relationships. They're, they're, they're helpful instead of hindering your progress. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and, and I guess, yeah, that, that brings up a good point is like through all of this, what I'm finally doing is like taking care of myself. Um, and by not – by using other people as like support, 
and also being able to give support to other people like to, that allows me to build healthy relationships and um i don't know like that give me that feeling of actual genuine connection that makes me feel valued so that's your number one yeah that genuine connection you know through meetings and and just general connection with all the people you mentioned what's number two is there a second thing you're doing that you feel like really is helping uh your your sobriety right now um well i, I would say n- number one is like by far the most important thing because it encompasses like my entire life basically um number number two is um I guess it's trying to practice mindfulness, um, and that that at Pinnacle was where, really where I picked picked that up for the first time. But like trying to be super present, um, not this is again goes back to like living life on life's terms of of not trying to force, not not I'm not like forcing any shortcuts to like try to get to any end goals right now. Like I'm I'm really just like being in the moment. I'm I'm keeping my life simple. I'm keeping the commitments that I've made when I say I'm going to be somewhere I'm there. Um, like just living super presently and mindfully. Mm -hmm. Um, and I feel like if you're in that mindset, like that, like I can't, I can't use drugs and alcohol in that mindset because I like recognize where I'm at right this second. Yeah. I feel like mindfulness, that active kind of meditative being in the moment grounded experience when people learn to live that way the authenticity in their life just skyrockets and things that help hold them back like substances get they they lose their luster don't they totally yeah yeah it's it's like it's it's much easier to recognize in like my current mindset that like drinking or using drugs right now would be a negative thing for me as opposed to being like oh maybe i should do that hey thank everyone for your support of project recovery do us a favor Tell your friends, give us a rating, write a review, hit the subscribe button. Thanks to Dr. Matt, our producer, John, too old for a Mohawk Smith. Stop it. (laughs) And everyone at KSL. This is Project Recovery, a KSL podcast.